Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, having me here and uh, for staying here to listen, although it's uh, later in the afternoon. And I am really sorry for this abrupt language, language switch. I've uh, managed to focus entire day to capture what you've been uh, talking about in Norwegian. And uh, uh, I hope I don't uh, say some Norwegian words and make it even more confusing. Um, so. As I've been already introduced, my name is Riala Spahic, and I'm a domain specialist and task manager of Responsible AI in Equinor. And uh, here you can see a little bit of a complicated uh, title slide. So there are uh, a bunch of logos in the corner, and I will start uh, explaining that why. So my project that I'm going to talk about today and a use case is going to be a use case that I've done during my PhD. And a disclaimer is that it's not something that I'm currently working on in Equinor, uh, but it is tightly related. That's why I took the liberty to write with a hint of responsible AI. Um, I've done my PhD at NTNU, uh, and my PhD was a part of this program called Brew 21 that stands for Better Resource Utilization in Oil and Gas Industry in 21st Century. And uh, the use case that I'm going to, and the project that I'm going to talk about today, uh, while it was in its abstract and proposal form, has won uh, me a research grant from Peter Satter Center for Advanced Study to do this research at the University of California, Berkeley, hence that logo as well. And my entire PhD was supported and funded by Equinor, and so was the data provided uh, that uh, we will see uh, today here. So um, the case study that you will see here, you can also find it uh, published in a Springer Nature's Discover AI journal under the name Image Based and Risk Informed Detection of Subsea Pipeline da Damage that I've um, wrote with the co-authors Kamashwar Pula from the University of California, Berkeley, Vidar Hepso from Equinor and NTNU, and Marianne Luntagen, my supervisor from PhD at NTNU. So, as I promised, deconstructing the front page. So let me start with the responsible AI. It is something I do at work, and um, it is something we've been talking about today, entire day. So I have faith that everyone has uh, already a, a, um, an idea of what responsible AI is. But if I were to break down uh, when I Google responsible AI and I see other many companies having the initiative of responsible AI, it comes down to some principles, values, and best practices. And most, mostly, we encounter fairness and biases the first. And we've heard about biases this morning. And in responsible AI, we talk about the gender bias and the racial bias. And uh, in this use case, we are going to see some biases when it comes to the subsea pipelines. And I hope you're excited about subsea pipelines. Um, nextly, uh, it's safety, where comes security, resilience, and robustness. And responsible AI's first mandate is to ensure that our AI systems are safe, that they perform as intended, and then we find ways to use AI in a safe way. So to use AI to enhance safety. Another thing that is often talked about and has been mentioned so many times this morning is transparency and explainability, making sure that AI is explainable, that it's transparent. I will also say that it's contestable, that we are able to challenge the outputs that the AI gives us, and that it's interpretable, that we can interpret it, and that it's traceable, that we can trace the outputs that AI gives us. And then finally, something human in the center of everything, human oversight. It's also one of the main uh, requirements from the EU AI Act for AI systems to be designed with a human oversight. There can be a human in control. We've talked about human in the loop. And a part of any responsible AI initiative is to uh, keep these practices in mind, make guidelines for our organizations on how to keep these practices in mind, and to follow international standards, analyze legal obligations, and make our own governance and be accountable for what we have. So that's where the hint of responsible AI comes from. And you can see the red squiggly line. It's because I was told by half till organizers that although my... Um, my presentation today is about a use case from my PhD to keep in mind that the general theme or the objective of the today will be responsible AI. And they said that responsible AI is the red thread. And I took it very seriously. This is the red thread. 
And uh, I'm going to have this red thread in the corners of uh, some slides. And it's, uh, I'm not going to focus on it too much. I only have less than 20 minutes. But uh, it's just something like a food for thought, something to carry with you. Uh, so we're going to go through a use case of uh, seeing damage on supply lines with AI, with autonomous drones, and see where responsible AI values, principles, and uh, workarounds come into place. So AI has been defined and redefined countless times, and we are still not sure how to define it, although we do have some legal definitions and many are objecting to them. But in this context, I want to say that I'm talking about AI as an umbrella term for a range of technologies. I'm going to talk about image uh, classification and machine learning and anomaly detection, and I'll come back to those, uh, those three later. Um, and AI being an umbrella term is also something that I've been uh, challenged on, but I keep by it. To me, AI is a range of technologies, um, and uh, I'll, I'll mention the technologies later. Now, let's see the risk-informed, this like, interesting part. I was very uh, proud when I came up with the oh, risk-informed artificial, artificial intelligence, and it came to be really popular. And I'm really glad, because I was doing my PhD from 2020 to 2023. And um, the responsible AI actually wasn't as hot of a topic as it is right now. So what does risk-informed approach mean? So it means that we are ensuring that the decisions between alternatives are taken with an awareness of the risk associated with options and that the attributes of a decision are considered in an integrated manner. And then we are going to see how does this apply to the AI for uh, inspecting subsea pipelines. Speaking of subsea pipelines, why the subsea pipelines? Well, the ever-growing demand for energy has subsea pipelines as the key factors and key players there. And if something is to happen to subsea pipelines, that uh, and, and many things can happen, many environmental factors can impa impact the pipeline's integrity, it can actually result in pretty catastrophic environmental and financial repercussions. So it's, a, it's quite a critical uh, player in the energy sector. And since 1970s, there, uh, we have built 8,800 kilometers of pipelines on the Norwegian continental shelf. And mind you, that is the distance between Oslo in Norway to Bangkok in Thailand. So that's pretty cool. And let's go back to the final part of the title, which is autonomous. So far, we have seen the potential in having human operators operate with remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs for short. If I mention it again, I'll say ROVs. Uh, and inspect pipelines. And you can see like uh, this little video how that would look like. And the human knows what to look for. But what if we can do it in a more automated uh, way? What if we can use AI to do it for us? And we can uh, have humans do something more uh, uh, different. So underwater autonomous systems uh, come to play. And that can be any sort of uh, drone that can hover over or can uh, latch on the pipelines or can walk by. And here we can see an image of a drone um, kind of like a swimming over a pipeline and scanning it uh, from, from the top. And that is exactly the type of images that I got for this use case to explore. And um, the reason for this is to see that we can enhance safety by using underwater autonomous systems. We can send these drones whenever we have a need to inspect the pipeline instead of sending vessels uh, and having it uh, a lot more complicated in that way. But there's just one challenge. The, these autonomous systems are not quite ready yet. So let's see what, what are those uh, things that the underwater autonomous systems want to look for. So there are many many, many, many pictures that the autonomous system can take, or it can be also a video. And these pictures would look something like this. And these are real pictures. And I can ask like around the room, how many of you would like to volunteer about a month to go through hundreds of thousands of these images with me and look for damage? Not many, it sounds pretty dull, right? And at some point we would also maybe even experience something called automation bias. I would be like, yeah, no, no, this is, this is OK. Next, next, and maybe I even miss out on something. But 
the autonomous systems, uh, we have a chance for them to not experience the automation bias, but they can experience other, uh, other biases that we will come to shortly. So these are some of the anomalies, so-called anomalies, or what can go wrong that are risk factors uh, on the pipeline. So we can find evidence of fluid leakage, some external damage, the formations, the bending, uh, corrosion. We can find objects in the nearby vicinity. So you can see a boulder there on the picture that can be carried away and damage the integrity of the pipeline. We can have a lot of debris that is blocking the visibility of the pipeline. So we don't know what's going on uh, under there. And then we can have ineffective pipeline support and buried pipelines. So these are some of the anomalies as risk factors. And today we are going to focus on the mechanical damage uh, that can uh, happen on, on the pipeline surface. So this list here um, is taken from a manual that human operators of ROVs uh, are reading and being trained on when they are operating the ROVs to look for uh, damages on the pipeline. Um, and of course, we need to have a way to kind of like prioritize not everything that we see weird or potentially a non, uh, like, a, like a damage uh, needs to be reported. So we need to prioritize it. So for example, if a pipeline is covered, is, if more than 50% of the pipeline, what you're seeing is covered uh, by sediment or by biological growth, that is something to be, for example, reported. And here we see, um, how the potential hazards are divided by their uh, potential of damage and the probability of occurrence. And that, this is something that is known to domain experts, right? But it's not something that is known to the autonomous system. So we need to make sure that the AI that we are using to look for this also has this information and knows how to prioritize. Because what actually happens is that we have an AI system, which is the autonomous drone, going over the pipelines and having a lot of false positives. It can tell the human operators, oh, there's something wrong going on, and it was a fish. Oh, there's something going on, and it was a turtle. There's something going on, and it was some trash on the seabed. So we don't want these kinds of false positives. We also only want the early warning signals that we can get. So. Risk assessment and risk analysis has taught us, and it's a very common and well-established approach for identifying what is it that can go wrong during this kind of operation. And throughout risk assessment, we get a list of hazards that are the potential sources of harm, the likelihood of their occurrences, the sequences of events that lead to them, and the consequences. And based on this, we can also do some prioritization. But when it comes to the AI, uh, some of the dominant approaches from AI side are uh, computer vision, for example, uh, which are methods for analyzing image data. And here we see some examples of how that would look like, the image segmentation and the object uh, detection next to the pipeline. We have machine learning that are the methods that learn from large amounts of data in order to find patterns, and it's going to be sensor data. And we have something that I really love. It's anomaly detection. And these are the methods that identify and report irregularities, so-called anomalies, in data patterns. So anomaly detection based on frequency analysis goes, OK, I'm encountering a lot of things. And if I'm encountering a lot of things, they are normal. Once I encounter something that I haven't been encountering so much, that is not normal, and that is strange, and that is an anomaly. And luckily for, for us, mechanical damage is one of those, and that is something we want to look into. So how does an AI system learn? Well, the most basic way of learning is we have a human saying, OK, AI, this here is an algae. And the human says, on many, many thousands of images, this is how an algae looks like. This is how a boulder looks like. This is how a damage looks like. And the AI learns, and then the AI can uh, be tested and say, OK, I'm 91% sure that this is an algae, because that's what I've learned from the human. But in reality, we don't have this kind of training data, and we don't want humans to, uh, to sit and uh, tell the machines what is what. So we resort to so-called unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning, although common, it comes with a lot of black box approaches that we've learned today are not, uh, not ideal. So what the unsupervised learning algorithm will do is to find objects based on their shape, and color and their pattern. And then they will identify it and report it back to us so we know what to do with it. 
Okay, but what is the problem with this? In these images, as you can see, we can see a lot of similar things. The images are monochromatic, which means they are the same kind of color, and a lot of the objects on them look very similar. Something can be noise, something can be anomaly, which means we don't know what it is exactly, it's just strange, and something can be hazard. And this is where the bias comes in. The data that we have for these kinds of use cases is heavily imbalanced because most of the things that we encounter would be noise and there are very few hazards. So it's vital for us to train the AI models that can extract this valuable information on hazardous occurrences from these massive amounts of data with so little evidence of hazards. And this is what the imbalanced or balanced data uh, is here. So what are some of the challenges with these AI-based approaches? Well, first of all, the imbalanced data. We need to distinguish from uh, very, very, very little evidence. We need to teach the AI uh, about this little evidence. We have insufficient training data, insufficient good training data. The image quality is very poor. Uh, these kinds of uh, tasks require a lot of computational resources. And then we resort to unsupervised methods that, uh, uh, that struggle with explainability, our trust, and finally our reliability. And if we have the responsible AI red thread, you can see and easily connect some of the responsible AI tasks to these challenges too. The bias, the data governance or the, the, the sufficiency of the data, sustainability, do, do we want to use heavy computer res resources and, uh, and damage our environment by it? And then finally explainability and transparency. So some of the ways we can address this imbalanced data are to generate more data. We can simulate, have computer simulations to generate it for us. Um, we can set up a lab in the pools uh, to collect more data. We can extrapolate with our already existing physics-based knowledge, which is rather heavy, and we can use generative AI. Other ways are to delimit the existing data that we have. We can set some boundaries for what we expect is normal, and we can have some rule-based conditioning, so conditional commands for decision making. But a lot of these um, are quite complex. They are computationally expensive, some of them are not representative, and if not enough, for the physical world. Uh, they are time-consuming, uh, they are not trustworthy, and one other thing is they don't provide for novelties. If I restrict my methods to only look for what I know, I lose on the information of what I don't know, and that's where anomaly detection is good at to find the irregularities and weird patterns in data, and sometimes these are novelties, something we didn't think about. So, what we can do, we can start by taking inspiration by, uh, by an international standard that was very recently published, but I had my hands on it while it was in its draft form, uh, to have some supervisory component to our AI system. So, we have an AI or machine learning component, and we have a supervisory component that will limit some of the logic or the outputs of the AI system. And why don't we use the domain knowledge, the domain experts, or the human in the loop for this? So this is a perfect example on how we are using the risk analysis insights and results to delimit the artificial intelligence to find the hazards that we are looking for, but to still keep the anomaly detection benefits in this uh, use case. So the idea was to use real data and identified risks that we've seen in the table before to extend the evidence of damages on pipelines and improve AI training. So I've had a data set of over 200,000 pipeline images that were recorded by an underwater autonomous drone. And I wanted to provide some low cost methodology to address the lack of training data. I didn't want to use generative AI because I believe there must be a better way. Um, I want to increase the number of pipeline damage images and have the, my AI system learn what the damage looks like. To and finally, we want to find a way to enhance the explainability of the AI approaches. So, what uh, I found out in, um, in, during this uh, study is that Microsoft in 2001 has had an algorithm for guided image interpolation. And we can use the existing images 
which were just a few, and I found them manually, of uh, pipelines with some anomalies, and that you can see this on the image A, mask it around, inspired by image segmentation approaches, and add it to a real image of a healthy looking pipeline. And we result in the image D of a completely synthetic image created by two real images. So we skipped the generative AI solution, although we were uh, inspired by the generative AI. And this I like because it, it contributes to the sustainability of responsible AI approaches. We don't drive the, we don't take the airplane when we can drive the bike. These are some more of the uh, images that are completely synthetic and there are synthetic damage on the pipeline. And I was, uh, I was really happy when these results came out and they just came out in a matter of seconds on my uh, student laptop. Um, and I asked and I called the pipeline specialist and they were like, yeah, uh, I don't see anything weird on these images. And I was like, yes, they are really realistic enough to be trained on. And luckily for me, I was able to train the AI on this and to have it finally find the damage on the pipelines among the thousands of images. And I did this with the uh, convolution and neural networks. And why CNN, although they are notorious for their lack of explainability, uh, is because they were very efficient and very fast and they didn't uh, require a lot of resources. But there was another thing. I applied an uh, explainability method on it with localized anomaly detection that would go into the CNN and extract the points, extract the snow with the Husky images, right? Uh, where the CNN has found the damage on the pipeline or where the CNN has found the distinctive regions and classified it as the damage on the pipeline. And to my, um, uh, to my luck, uh, you can see the results here. Uh, that uh, A and B, for example, show the real. Yes, the, my CNN has extracted the damage on the pi pipeline because of the correct reasons, not because there was snow in the background or in case something else in the background, but because of the real reasons. Um, and this is then something for the human in the loop or for human uh, who is overseeing the results to decide on. Um, is the image B, where there's a dislocated anode cover on the side of the pipeline, something worth uh, reacting to immediately or not? And then we see the C uh, image is a damage on a pipeline and some background noise. So the background noise is the little uh, red uh, square in the corner, which is something that we are not really interested in, and that would be a false alarm. So this has resulted in the methodology that looks like this, which is an expanded uh, architecture of a usual um, machine learning uh, cycles uh, or data analysis life cycle. So firstly, we gather the data and understand the problem. Then we observe the data to identify hazards by ourselves and prepare the data to extract the hazards and annotate these few images. So not a lot of work, not a month of work. It took some hours. And we process the data to generate synthetic hazards and expand the training data. And then we train, which is usual. Uh, we test and validate. It's another usual approach to this. And finally, we communicate and interpret the results to increase the explainability and interpretability and traceability values that uh, responsible AI uh, is looking for. But it wouldn't be fair to not talk about some limitations of this approach. Uh, so to limit the, to, to increase the sustainability of the entire method, we need to resize some of the images that may cause some information loss. This may be prevented with maybe better equipment or may, maybe better models. Um, then retaining the large image size has substantially increased time and power needed for classification, uh, which would combat the sustainability values. Uh, in this project, we have done uh, classification of only one anomaly. The future work would be to uh, expand it to all of the other risk factors that uh, human operators are also trained for. And um, uh, in this approach as well, smaller damage has been mis classified uh, on the pipelines. So what are the main takeaways? By creating synthetic hazard data uh, we can, with low cost, we can improve the training process and we can create synthetic data that we can share uh, given an open ac access and not share the sensitive information. With some explainability approaches on top of it, we can localize anomalies 
uh, that were distinct uh, that were distinctive regions on images and reduce the resource waste to minimize noise. And we can increase reliability on the AI uh, approach by knowledge exchange and including the domain expertise that we already have. So this is all to ensure the reliability of unmanned autonomous systems and to enhance the safety of remote op operations. And the responsible AI red threads uh, come through sustainability, openness, explainability, traceability, and safety. Um, you can see uh, this uh, research and uh, similar related research in uh, published uh, publications uh, listed uh, here. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you so much for your attention and uh, I'm ready for questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're beh uh, behind schedule. So I think uh, if people have questions, maybe they can take it afterwards. Yes. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we must have videos, so we should go all